<laughs> okay, let me start the timer here. Okay, it's great pleasure to be here today. Thanks to the organizers. Um, looking forward to the keynote this afternoon as well as the second panel. Um, beautiful day in Madison. It's, um, maybe I should have come here instead of Ann Arbor a long time ago, but it's, it's really great to be here. Um, I uh, have spent the last 15 years of my career studying China's rise and uh, its effect on its own people, uh, particularly through the lens of trade and foreign direct investment, which have been very important to China's outward emergence, um, its integration into the global economy. Uh, and in 2017, um, I had the privilege of having a sabbatical in Washington. And while my plans originally were to write a nice, quiet little book on China, sort of the whole world sort of changed. And I got back into thinking about what I originally started, which is U.S. trade uh, and U.S.-China trade. And I had written a paper um, prior to that on U.S. manufacturing employment and offshoring to low-income countries. So it wasn't completely different, but, you know, of course, the issues we're talking about are different. Things have happened that we never thought were going to happen, such as the U.S. considering dramatic trade, uh, you know, quotas on importations of automobiles. So there's a lot of things that you... Uh, might not have dreamed about uh, three years ago, which are now happening and we're discussing all the time. Um, I talked to someone this morning about what happens if we close the Mexican border. And this is, <laughs> this is again, something we wouldn't have been talking about, not, at least not uh, as anything else but the result of a national you know, disaster. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is probably a little different than, than Mindy's uh, uh, charge to us. But I think it will, as our, as our day goes along, I think it will... Uh, uh, show that it has some, some re relevance to the discussion about the backlash. When we think about the backlash, we think right away about income distribution, about the fact that an enormous amount of wealth was created with China's emergence into the global economy. And I, you know, China is my area of expertise, and so of course I have a bit of myopic there, but it is the biggest story of the, of, of the last 30 years in the international uh, world. There are many others, and I'm, I'm sure we'll hear more about as we go along, but um, so we had this sort of seismic uh, change in the global economy. It created an enormous amount of wealth. And we know that one of the biggest problem is that wealth was not shared equally. It's not that the wealth was created. It's that, that we had people who became better off and people who became worse off as a result of it. Um, you might think that our policymakers are just d doubling down and really thinking about how do we help these poor people. But I think that's not true. And so I'm going to raise the issues that I think are dominating some of the discussions today. Uh, and hopefully later we can talk about, uh, is this too cynical of you? Uh, what are the implications uh, for uh, redistribution that come from these types of policies? Remember, redistribution can go up as well as down. So um, that's something we might want to talk about. Um, so it is narrow in scope in the sense that I, I do see it in terms of the big players, but it, and I am most well-versed in the U.S.-China trade dispute. but. Clearly, European Union, Japan are also involved in some of the issues that I'm going to talk about. Okay, let's see if we can begin. Okay, so the U.S.-China conflict was driven by basically three rising tensions. Um, and uh, yes, we can say that people feel that China's rise has not um, made them better off. Well, clearly it's made some people better off, but many people not better off, or particular areas of the country. And yet, um, I think that... Um, it has led to, to perhaps uh, a different policy response than we might have expected. The first is that we've seen a, a resurfacing of economic nationalism and a renewed focus on, on exports uh, and trade surpluses as sort of a measure of how, how, how gainful trade is. And this is clearly um, embodied in a lot of what President Trump says because he'll say things like, you know, when we have a trade deficit with someone that we're just giving the money away. So it's this view that that's... It's, clearly an indicator of loss. Um, whereas if we had trade surpluses, presumably we'd be getting money. I mean, so this is a, a renewed um, focus on this metric, uh, which most economists would say is, is really not a good metric. But nevertheless, it, reviews, it has this idea behind it of sort of mercantilism. Exports are good. Imports are bad. It needs to be us, not them, who are doing this. Um, so that's one, and I'll kind of try to flesh that out in a minute. The second is that trade and investment flows are seen as main routes for leakages of national strategic assets. Um, this is, of course, uh, a very important conversation that people are having because we do know there are legitimate uh, concerns about uh, U.S. economic health um, and uh, innovation, and there are very important issues about 
intellectual property theft. Um, but you'll, I think uh, we can see that these uh, linkages are um, between trade and investment and national strategic assets can also be used for other purposes. So I'll come back to that in a minute. And the third is national security concerns as a means of reducing competition in high tech sectors and in other sectors. Uh, you may know that um, uh, steel and aluminum tariffs came to us via Section 232, uh, which is a basically allegating it, that steel imports are a national security concern or threat. The same thing will happen if the president moves forward with restrictions in the automobile area. That will be under Section 232. It will be considered national security threats. So I will first want to look at economic nationalism and a renewed focus on exports and trade surpluses. Um, so the Trump administration gives strong voice um, to this impulse. And you know, I find as I talk to people in various places around the country that for them this kind of makes sense that exports are good, trade surpluses are bad. Um, and yet you know, economists have for years said, no, what really matters um, is both exports and imports. Uh, and whether on net we're able to you know, have more stuff with trade than we had without trade. So we look at it very differently. Um, and there's this mismatch kind of between the way we think about national health and the way sort of the popular vision of economic health. And I think that gives a certain level of populist dynamic to President Trump's focus on trade deficits as a measure of uh, bad deal, in his words. Um, the problem with this, though, is that we are now on a road to have persistent large trade deficits for the foreseeable future. So we're basically headed to lots and lots more tension. Um, a large part of that is due to the very large unfunded tax cut that uh, we enacted last year. Um, but there are other reasons. We already had trade deficits before the tax cut. Uh, unfortunately, China is at the end of a long uh, long supply chains, global supply chains, and China ends up with being the last hands that touch the iPhone before it comes to the United States, for example. And so our, our, our surplus, our deficit is very large with China, and I think it will continue to be large with China. Um, so you might say, okay, so what do we do about this? Can we stop these deficits? And of course the answer is no, we can't stop the deficits. We can stop the deficit with certain countries if we decide not to trade with them. And we've seen rather draconian threats uh, to stop trade, such as 25% tax on all imports from China, or even you know, stopping trade as it moves across the border with Mexico. So here are two charts that at least show what I'm talking about, about US current account balance. And here we see that on the left-hand side that the United States is forecast to have a current account deficit for years to come. Um, and there's really nothing on the horizon to change that. There's no plans for big tax increases or, or big spending cuts that would balance the, at least the government deficit. On the right-hand side is the Chinese current account balance. And what you notice is the Chinese are rapidly moving toward balance. So what we're going to have is a condition where overall on the macro level, China is in balance and U.S. is wildly out of balance. Now that's at the aggregate level. At the bilateral level, we'll almost certainly still see a deficit from China to, uh, with China because of where China ends up in global supply chains. And this is just a picture for electronics. And you see those blue lines, there's a lot of stuff that just ends up coming at the end of the East Asian supply network over to the United States. And that's not going to change uh, except for very strong policy barriers that will be put in place. The last thing I want to say about this part is that U.S. imports from China clearly reflect global supply chain. So people will say, yes, but you know, China's become more productive, which it has. But especially between you, the U.S.-China bilateral relationship is heavily mediated by multinational firms. So here we've taken China customs data and looked at the share of exports to, from China to the world or from China only to the United States and asked, how much of those are coming from foreign enterprises operating in China? So for companies like Foxconn, which is a Taiwanese company, or a, a German-owned affiliate, or a US-owned affiliate. And what you see is that for the United States, which is the burgundy bar there, red bar, uh, that number has exceeded 
60%. So 60% of our imports from China are basically coming from foreign investor enterprises. Those are almost by definition supply chain trade. So the story of US-China can't be told without the role of multinationals involved. Um, and it will be heavily out of balance for years to come. The second thread we see is that trade and investment policies have become tools for what is now being called techno-nationalism. That is that we have to have the best technology, we have to have indigenous innovation, and we have to be very careful that this doesn't get shared. This is very different than I think the language that we used even 10 years ago, uh, where in the Doha round we were talking a lot about the importance of technology transfers to developing countries as a way to help them grow. Um, if you say that now, basically no one's interested. So the US moves to reduce uh, technological diffusion to its competitors. The Section 301 complaint is largely about technology transfers, whether they're happening through forced joint ventures or through cyber theft. Um, there's opposition to China's support for indigenous innovation, which is mainly embodied in its strategic emerging industries program, of which Made in China 2025 is really a handmaiden for. Uh, Germany has just issued a new industrial plan with a focus on combating the co competitive threats from, guess who, US and China. And this new policy specifically includes mergers to create national competition champions. So forget antitrust, we're gonna make sure we get these gigantic firms that can compete in their mind anyway. Uh, state support of specific firms and industries and closing of strategic check entirely to foreign competition. So it's, it's basically, uh, a mixture of industrial policy, antitrust, and um, or anti-antitrust and protectionism. The stakes are very high, even for a country like China, not to mention other emerging market, emerging uh, economies. Here I have some information that I've gathered from uh, the Chinese Bureau of Statistics, showing China's high-tech sector and where those exports are coming from. And the white bar at the bottom is high-tech exports from Chinese domestic firms. And what you see is it's a relatively small share. Well, who's, who's doing the rest of exporting of computers, uh, pharmaceuticals, certain types of chemicals? And the answer is foreign investors operating in China, including American corporations, but largely Taiwanese, Korean, Japanese, uh, British, German. Um, and so you can see there's two types there. The middle bar is companies that are owned uh, or registered in Hong Kong, Macau, or Taiwan. And then the dark and growing bar, which is uh, companies from basically OEC, uh, that have homes in OECD countries. So China is very well aware that it is still highly dependent on foreign technology for its high tech sector and will be for a very long time. And so hence the reason why President Trump certainly has their attention right now. Um, but if you can say China, which has emerged as this huge high tech exporter, of course, a lot of the value added in those exports is reflecting uh, you know, OECD technology. If a country like this is, is really seeing and knows how important it is, you can think about what everybody else retreating into their own little technological house will do for any other uh, country that would like to engage in global value chains as a way of raising itself uh, out of poverty. The last uh, issue I want to raise is security concerns about these technology exports and imports. You'll notice there's a theme running through, which is that everybody is obsessed with technology exports. Uh, and technology exports, are, of course, are a pretty broad basket. Uh, the, even the cord on your computer device is included in most high-tech measures. Um, but you know, there are increasingly security concerns being raised about tech exports and imports. And as we look to future technologies, we're constantly being told that these security issues will grow. Um, three first sales of US components to China are seen as a conduit for technology um, to so-called uh, bad guys, ZTE, Huawei. So ZTE in particular involved exports of US chips. The US remains the premier US uh, semiconductor manufacturer in the world. Um, so we see that our outflow of our exports can be a threat. The second thing that can be a tr threat is imports. Chinese high tech as a high tech supplier uh, can be a, a, a threat. So backlash against Chinese 5G exports or concerns about Chinese parts and the so-called Internet of Things. Um, these tensions will only get higher as China becomes an innovation and innovator, and China is pouring a great deal of national resources into innovation. It's now spending more than any other country uh, in the world, 
in absolute terms except the United States. Uh, and uh, no longer will we be able to think, we won't be able to think of it simply as a link in the thing, it's going to be a designer and a producer. How, what does that mean in terms of the splintering of the global economy? So I just want to say two more things and then I'll end. One is that security concerns cover investment flows as well as imports and, imp and exports, as Mark mentioned. Uh, we have um, uh, increased concern and screening of foreign direct investment into the United States. Um, it's interesting because this week we saw that the United States has blocked the Chinese acquisition of Grindr, uh, which is an, a dating app, right? And why Grindr? Well, it could be some American military guys are using <coughs> Grindr. So you can see that these concerns and worry about these concerns really leading to just bifurcation of the two economies um, is something that we need to be discussing. Um, China is using si domestic tools for similar goals, including data localization and privacy concerns to uh, make sure that it uh, eliminates in, uh, competition in its domestic uh, digital and in internet sphere. Um, and these mar they have a whole host of market barriers that are being used to promote indigenous innovation. Made in China 2025 subsidies are aimed at advanced manufacturing, but it's important to note that they also are uh, look, look for domination in key information technologies, including things like AI. So to end, I see there's three manifestations that I see of a techno-nationalist backlash, maybe different than the backlash that you expected me to talk about, which is a focus on exports and trade imbalances as measures of benefits of bilateral relationships with, of course, the coming clash, which is that the US is going to be persistently in deficit and we're not going to be able to resolve this. Uh, secondly, that market access and technology transfer limits, limits on market access and tech transfer um, will continue and they'll be used as competitive devices um, and intellectual property rights can be increasingly be seen as a form of industrial policy. Um, lastly, we have had heightened national security concerns and greater restrictions on flows of high-tech goods and knowledge uh, and these flows have been integral to the U.S.-China relationship. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker is Phil Devi. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here with you. Um, I'm very happy to be included in this. Uh, it's a great topic, and this is my hometown, so it's nice to be back. Um, all right, <clears throat> there we go. So I am going to take on some of the sort of backlash against trade and globalization directly, and just in case I get waylaid on any of these points, I'm going to give you an idea of what I hope you will take away from the whole thing. Um, this won't be news that trade and globalization came under attack uh, in the election. I'll sort of detail a little bit of that, mostly to show you a few fun pictures. Um, then I will argue that as part of this, there was a very particular focus on what happened in manufacturing. So I'll give you a little bit of what actually happened in manufacturing and why it's a little problematic to do some of the linkages to trade. I'll also argue that a big part of the public discontent, which was led to some of the trade wars we're seeing now, has been a particular concern with China, the sort that Mary was talking about. And I would argue that that received particular backing from some academic work, which I will argue is somewhat misguided, and I'll try to convince you of that. And then, uh, you know, it's sort of obligatory. I'll try to conclude with some rays of hope of how it, it gets better from here. Um, we'll see if you find it persuasive. All right, so first, the, the 2016 election. Um, trade played a, a strikingly big role in this election that we had uh, well, both candidates turning against uh, major undertakings like the TPP, but President Trump being particularly strident um, with harsh criticisms of trade deals such as the TPP, such as NAFTA, blaming them in particular for manufacturing job loss, um, and promising that he would do something about it, uh, which he is largely, um, which he has largely followed up on. The, what he was responding to was sort of popular discontent, which has been there for quite a while. Um, this is a fairly recent photo of you know, NAFTA seen as sort of being bad for workers and killing U.S. manufacturing. But that's been a refrain of the labor movement for decades now, um, that NAFTA was responsible. Uh, so NAFTA or NAFTA-style agreements, um, as they are fond of saying. And this is sort of my evidence of... Uh, of sort of the particular concern about China. Um, if you do a book like this, you get to be a top White House advisor. Um, this is Peter Navarro. But the, the idea that it, there was a particular damage done 
by, by trade with China. All right, so let me turn then, so time being limited, to what's actually behind this. And I'm going to take, so first manufacturing and then China um, and try and see what we can do. So I want to show you three pictures of the manufacturing sector. So as you can see with this sort of nice downward sloping line, this is decline. This is the declinist story about American manufacturing. What we're depicting here is the share of employees who work in the manufacturing sector in the United States. So share of US employees working in the manufacturing sector. This is the longest of my three graphs. This one goes back to about 1940 or so. And the vertical bars in between are recessions. So that can help you uh, sort of time things. It'll also be sort of interesting when we look at output. Um, what you see is that at the beginning of the period, right around during the, the Second World War, we had almost 40% of workers working in the manufacturing sector. So I think sometimes when there's a hearkening back, a thinking to, you know, let's make America great again, this was a particular kind of opportunity that maybe not terribly high skill demands and an, and an availability of jobs in this sector, which led to perhaps a middle class lifestyle. A couple things to note about this. One, this is just eyeballing it, there's no fancy econometrics here, it's somewhere around the mid-1960s uh, that this starts a fairly secular decline. Not quite a straight line, there are a few wiggles, but as economics go, it's a pretty straight line. Um, bottoming out in around 2010. And so we, t we go from having, if we go from the mid-60s, I don't know, 27% or so of workers in the manufacturing sector to ultimately 8%. That's a dramatic change uh, in terms of how available this is as, a, as, a, as employment. And in fact, I think that understates just how dramatic the shock was because that 8%, the, those jobs have changed qualitatively, that there's higher skill requirements, um, that now this is not something you maybe do just out of high school. You probably maybe need a couple years of technical college. You need to be able to sort of reprogram that computer-guided machine tool. This is not just sort of lifting pallets and doing the like. So there is a dramatic shift there, which have, it really has been very unsettling for people who you know, had previously seen real opportunities in the sector. Now, the, before leaving this slide, I also want to point out what's not there. So I'd like you all to look at the period right around 1994 when we did NAFTA and the Uruguay round and look at the sharp break in this line. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, the, and then you can go, China's accession to the WTO was around 2001. You get a slight dip in the recession, but most all of this predates that these were trends that were in place long before. So it's kind of hard to make the causal argument that this was really what caused the decline of American manufacturing. And even to say the decline of American manufacturing is to be a little bit loose because all I've shown you so far is employment shares. So let me move on then. I will actually show you what you, we would probably think of as the health of the sector. What are we getting in terms of output? All right, here's real output. It's not the same time frame. This is picking up in the mid-1980s, because that's when the data was available for this. But this is adjusting for inflation. What's happened to output for the manufacturing sector? It's an index where I think it's, uh, it's uh, 2009 equals 100. So it's all indexed. What we see, though, is over the course of this, from the mid-1980s, we go from a level of about 70 to, about 2016, a level of near 130, I believe. Yeah. So, from, so we are almost doubling the amount of stuff that we're making in the economy. That's not really a story of decline. Yes, you can see, as I said, the vertical bars are recessions, and so in recessions you do see sharp drops in, in manufacturing output, but we're at pretty close to all-time highs in terms of what we are producing. My third graph essentially just divides the two graphs by each other, which takes the shorter time frame, and argues that part of what's going on here, or much of what's going on here, is a big productivity boom. Um, it's one that levels off at the end, which we may be a little bit concerned about, but what you see is this dramatic thing from the mid-80s. If you have an index, again, 2009 equals 100, having this scaled, uh, we go from about 48 to about 125. So dramatic increase. This is real output per worker in the manufacturing sector. So a dramatic increase in productivity. That's the other side of the sort of changing nature of these jobs, which is 
the sector has changed. And so now, what does that mean for globalization? Well, there, you know, what we've seen in the manufacturing side is there are there reasons why you would have sort of public concern and discontent about developments? Yes, of course. This is you know serious transformation of this important sector. How likely is it this is attributable to trade? That's another question. Um, that we saw that a lot of these trends actually predated trade, and we weren't seeing the sharp movements um, at the at the time uh, when we might have otherwise expected them to. All right. Oh, I'll just do it in passing. Um, Mary touched on this a little bit with trade deficits. In case you haven't seen things like this, again, in terms of the discontent, it's so tempting to have trade deficits as a measure. This puts trade deficits as a share of GDP in blue, the unemployment rate in green. Uh, economists can give you long talks about, you know, balance of payments, accounting, and the like, and, and why we have these things. This is a little bit easier. It just sort of says that frequently, when you see trade deficits go up, things are actually getting better in the country, at least the things that we care about. It doesn't correlate well with our normal sense of well-being. I won't dwell on this too much. Um, ah, Peterson Institute stuff. Uh, just no, this is actually, this is reinforcing some of what Mary was saying. Um, this is some stuff from Brad Jensen, talking about global supply chains, how this idea uh, that you've got sort of importers and exporters, and exporters are good and importers are bad, this is what Brad Jensen went and showed was, it's not importers or exporters, they're often one and the same. And he went and looked at the firm level data, and this is showing that if you take the top 1% of US exporters, 90% of them are importers, and 36% end up in the top 1% of, of importers. And you actually get similar things if you look at it on the export side. All right, let me go on to the China shock, because that way I'll be able to offend many of my economic colleagues. Um, or maybe amuse. So, the other thing that was kind of novel here, so we've had this refrain, trade agreements are killing us and China's killing us. And there was a frequent response, which is, ah, that's kind of economically illiterate. Until the China shock literature. Um, so this has been uh, the craze that swept uh, at least trade economics, which was to say, no, they're actually right. That, that China's been having this really disastrous effect, at least on local labor markets. Um, and there's two components to this. One is to say there was a shock, and two is to say, and it really was China that was affecting the well-being of local labor markets. Um, both are somewhat problematic. The, and I won't sort of go through all of this stuff. The problem, that, problem with arguing that there was a shock is it's a little bit hard to know what the shock was. The closest they come in terms of picking a moment was we let China into the WTO. Hmm. Does that mean we cut tariffs on China? Well, no, the tariffs were exactly the same both before and after. We stopped threatening to raise those tariffs, but nobody really believed that we were going to raise those tariffs in the first place. In fact, we had left those tariffs right where they were even through events like Tiananmen Square in 1989. So what was the shock? Um, well, as the authors who did this very well-known study Put it, well, the shock was that people really were secretly living in fear, that tariff increases were about to get them, and it was only when we did permanent normal trading relations with China that this fear subsided. Well, what was the fear? What were they worried about? Were they worried about a, an orangish president who was going to come in and stick, you know, 25% or 45% tariffs and everything? No, because if they, if they were worried about that, you wouldn't have identification in your regressions. It turns out that what you need people to be worried about very specifically is the reimposition of the Smoot-Hawley tariffs of 1930. Somewhat implausible, I won't dwell on it much, but th this, they're really, it was, it's hard to actually identify what was the shock. There certainly was a big change with China's emergence, but this is a sort of troubling part of the underpinnings of this literature. I'm gonna move on from that in the interest of um, humoring the organizers and sticking to my schedule, uh, and talk about what did that shock do? How important was China for its effect on US labor markets? And what I want to describe here is what economists refer to as the identification problem. Uh, this would actually be, so we've got several potential causes of what's happening with job loss. Um, I just described in the manufacturing stuff, technological change is one candidate. China, which could be China policy or trade measures, or just simply developments in China, could be another candidate. So could developments in other countries. 
The identification problem is how do we disentangle all of these? How do we know which part of this was actually due to China? If that was the only thing that changed, then it's easy. If all three of these change at the same time, it's significantly harder. Um, we still have various ways we might try to disentangle them, but it's really tough. Hardest is if the changes in China mask what's going on in other countries so that you may have sort of unobserved changes that you don't recognize, but that are actually going on. Let me give an example which might make this a little bit clearer. Totally made up numbers, because that's what I do. Um, and let's just suppose that we look at the unit costs of making something. And hypothetically, we'll start out just sort of assign some to various candidates. So we've got US labor in there, we've got China in there, and I put in some other candidates, such as an, a more automated process or countries like Mexico and Vietnam. And then let's assume that we get change over time. I have US labor as the most expensive, so assuming a labor intensive process. The point of all of these sort of moving lines is at, at the beginning, China looks the cheapest. Over time, you start seeing other countries look the cheapest, like Vietnam, or then automation looks cheaper than them all. Now, this could be entirely hypothetical, except it actually matches fairly well with what we've seen with experience, that China no longer ends up being the low-cost country. And that means that if there's any degree of continuity, you actually did have um, other countries sort of working behind there, which means if you somehow wished China away, it's not quite clear what the thought experiment of some of these papers is, but if you wish China away, it doesn't follow that everything goes to demand for US labor intensive products. All right, I'm gonna skip over some things and just give you that hope that I promised, which is in terms of backlash and public opinion, this is my last slide, I promise, no one needs to rush the stage. Um, the, in terms of the hope that I promised, this is some work that my organization does as a public opinion uh, arm, and they do surveys over time, and they ask, what do people think about trade? And you actually did not see great dips leading into 2016, but you saw a degree of skepticism. They ask this in several different ways, and they're all represented here. They say, overall, do you think trade is good or bad for? And there's several answers you might give. It could be for consumers like you, or for the US economy, or for creating jobs. The thing that's striking here, of course, is if you look at what happened from 2016 to 2017 and 2017 to 2018, by any of these measures, you get a sharp upturn in public opinion about trade. And you start getting the highest numbers that we've seen in decades for this. I'll, venture, I'll close with just a sort of a hypothesis about why that might be, which is we're now having a more honest discussion about trade. That what we had had for a number of decades were people saying, here are these ills, let's blame them on trade. As we sort of shut off parts of trade, we realize what we're missing and you're getting much more public discussion of these are some of the benefits we're getting and therefore a more balanced evaluation. I'll stop there. Thank you. Our final speaker is Ian Coxhead and then we'll open up for questions afterwards. I have no slides for you. So I hope you're happy about that. It's been described, no, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, thanks. So um, a couple of very quick general observations before I begin uh, talking about the area in which I actually have some knowledge. Uh, the, when we talk about the backlash against trade and globalization, I guess what are the data that we have in mind? And part of those data are uh, an observation that in the wake of the global financial crisis, somewhere around the 2010 point, uh, global trade started growing much more slowly than global GDP. And people looked at those numbers and got uh, pretty alarmed, I guess. And, uh, and of course, the recovery uh, has taken place, but it's been kind of anemic as well. So there are some real concerns about uh, whether global trade can uh, continue to be regarded as a somehow as an engine for global economic growth. Um, how much of this is due to a, what we might call a backlash, a, a change in attitudes, a change in preferences and policies, and how much is due to other things, including the uh, uh, including the kind of processes of structural change that both Mary and Philip have uh, have discussed in their remarks. One very big important part of that is the rise of services as incomes grow, and incomes are growing very fast uh, around the world outside of uh, the North Atlantic countries. Uh, then uh, services demand grows faster than income, and a lot of services are not traded uh, internationally, and that means that the share of total expenditure uh, in the developing world in particular is increasingly uh, turning uh, 
towards non-traded goods. So then that means that the total share of trade and GDP for lots of countries uh, doesn't rise as fast as it would under other conditions. Another part of this uh, story is that uh, large developing economies, especially China, but uh, soon I think it was also India, are becoming much more sophisticated and so they're kind of uh, reshoring large parts of their own uh, global, uh, uh, their own uh, value chain. So instead of China importing, for example, uh, wiring harnesses and screens and things like that from Thailand or Philippines or other countries, increasingly they're producing it at home. So that also reduces trade. That doesn't mean that uh, global, uh, the value of global production for trade has gone down. It just means that the parts and components part of that is not uh, growing quite as fast as it was before. So when we look at the data and we say there's a backlash against trade, there's, we have to, I think, sort out what part of that is a, really a shift in preferences and policies and what part of that is due to other deeper uh, structural factors. <clears throat> Um, as for you know, actual new anti-trade measures, of course, they are really limited in terms of the countries that are adopting them. The United States uh, leading the way. Little England, remember them? Remember that country? Uh, uh, also uh, expressing that kind of anti-trade thing. But you know, England's well, the UK's trade is about the same as that of Hong Kong, a little bit less than that of Singapore in value terms. So whether that has a big implication for the global economy is not quite so obvious. Uh, as far as the U.S. goes, I think the last thing I want to say at a general level is that the logic of U.S. action on trade is in some respects compelling. I don't mean that I agree with it, but it is also the case that big countries can win trade wars so long as they are willing to absorb the cost of conducting those wars. And uh, the United States, I think, has come very, very close to demonstrating that with respect to China. The U.S. economy is much bigger than that of China, uh, and the cost to China of, uh, of a downturn in trade is a significantly higher fraction of their GDP than is the cost to the U.S. So if you're really willing to sock it to your own people, which is what trade wars do, uh, hard enough and for long enough, then you can actually prevail in a trade war setting. And I think that, for me, is a very, is something that I think about quite a lot, and it alarms me a lot as well. But, you know, I'm not really a trade economist. I'm a development economist. And so I want to turn now to uh, thinking about all of this kind of through the other end of the telescope. When we talk about the backlash against trade and globalization, I think in some respects we are looking through the big end of the telescope and kind of foreshortening our view of the rest of the world. The rest of the world is uh, made up primarily of developing countries. And the developing country perspective on trade, I think, does not involve words like backlash really at all. Uh, the developing country perspective on trade is more like trade is a really terrific engine for growth and job creation and uh, and the more we can get of it uh, the better off we'll be uh, however the fact of uh, declining relative trade and the fact of backlashes in or policy changes in really big countries like the united states and not so big countries like middle england uh, uh, potentially uh, have consequences for the developing world and those plus some other structural changes is what i'll talk about for the remaining few minutes that I have. First thing that I think we need to notice, and uh, it's kind of not always obvious, is that the growth of global trade is increasingly concentrated in the developing world. Uh, uh, if we look at um, uh, GDP growth rates around the developing world, China's growing at more than 6% per year, India at more than 7% per year, uh, ASEAN, the Southeast Asian economies which make up about 9% uh, of the global economy, growing at more than 6% per year. Compare that with the North Atlantic economies, that is Europe and the United States, and we can include Japan there, uh, their overall growth rate much less than 3% per year. So the balance of global economic growth is taking place outside of the arena in which most of the discussion about a backlash against trade is occurring. And I think that's kind of important to keep in mind. Uh, from the developing country perspective or the developing world perspective, globalization has pulled millions, uh, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And the logic of that is very, very clear in those countries. And it goes like this. If your industry or your firm is selling only into the domestic market, then on balance, the potential growth of your output is, uh, is going to be you know, pretty closely linked to the growth rate of GDP in that country. You can do a little bit better or a little bit worse by uh, being a more successful competitor against uh, other firms doing the same thing, but those differences will be small. So if the economy is growing at 6% per year, then that kind of gives us a general idea of how fast you can expect your uh, 
uh, output to grow. Whereas, if you sell to the rest of the world, there is, in some respects, no limit to how fast you can grow. Vietnam's uh, electronics industry uh, grows at about five times the rate of Vietnam's GDP every year. It grows at about 30%. So think about that in terms of incomes, think about that in terms of jobs that are created, and you can see that the logic of globalization and of a commitment to trade in the developing world is very, very powerful. And, uh, and that's the, uh, the view that gets expressed most frequently, at least in the parts of the developing world that I hang out in, which is mostly East Asia, so maybe other views. Um, so, you know, I think that's really important uh, to keep in mind, that kind of uh, uh, economic growth. Second thing is that most of the, uh, at the margin, most of the new growth in trade is taking place not between North-North trading partners, that is across the North Atlantic or with Japan uh, and the United States and Europe, uh, and it's not even North-South, that is poor countries trading with rich countries, it is South-South. Trade. So South-South trade now makes up about 45% of total world merchandise exports and about 30-something, 30 31, 32% of world services exports as well. And these are numbers which have grown hugely in the last generation and even in the last 10 years or so. Uh, so, uh, so developing countries increasingly account for a very large share of total world trade and a very, a much, an increasingly large share of that trade is taking place within the global south and not uh, between the global south and the, and the global north as well. And this is not just Asia. Uh, uh, if we look at East Asia, it's certainly the case there. It's very, very big there. Uh, we look at uh, ASEAN, for example. South-South trade within the ASEAN, the, the 10 or 11 uh, ASEAN countries, about uh, one quarter of their total trade. It's a pretty significant amount. Uh, but even within Africa, in the last decade, uh, the, uh, the continent of Africa, has begun to trade with itself at a very much higher rate, and now uh, intra-African trade accounts for about 20% of African exports. That's up from about uh, less than 10%, uh, less than 15 years ago. So that's a really significant shift. And what it says, the center of gravity of international trade is moving away from the North Atlantic plus Japan uh, economies. You know, of course, they're still huge, but uh, increasingly the growth in this at the margin is taking place uh, within the global south. Um, that said, uh, there are still significant threats from what we're characterizing as a backlash against globalization and trade uh, from, the, uh, from the global north, which is where that backlash takes place. The west, that is America, Europe, and I'm going to include Japan, uh, is still the market for about half of the exports produced in the developing world. So what happens in the United States as far as trade policy is concerned still has a very significant implication for at least some of the developing, uh, some of the developing world. So, the, if the backlash takes the form of unilateral uh, tariffs imposed by the United States, for example, that's going to matter for some countries. Uh, if the backlash takes a deeper and more uh, institutional form, like a shift away from uh, dependence on the uh, uh, cooperation with the WTO towards bilateralism, that also has significant implications. Uh, for the developing world. So I want to explore those a little bit, and then I want to uh, talk a little bit about some somewhat deeper structural issues that I think matter. So if we talk about trade wars, uh, two immediate consequences for any uh, country uh, engaged, even if it's not a direct participant. The first is trade diversion. The second is trade destruction. <clears throat> trade diversion uh, means that uh, because we're having a fight with China about stuff, there are producers of stuff in China uh, who are saying, well, you know, if I want to escape the tariffs that the U.S. is imposing, then I need to relocate my production base to another country. And uh, there was a lot of talk about that last year, lots of coverage of it in the press as well. Chinese producers of things like furniture and other labor-intensive processes saying, you know, I can't survive in, uh, uh, in China anymore with the tariff, uh, actual or, imp or threatened tariff from the United States, so I'm going to move the whole factory to Cambodia, right? Now, it's good for Cambodia in the sense that they get jobs and they get investment uh, out of that. So trade diversion can cut two ways. Uh, there are going to be winners and losers in that, and that's going to be case by case. Trade destruction, that is a general slowing down of the global economy and with it global trade because of the actions of countries, uh, of governments like that of the United States, I think is a much less uh, concerning issue because I think it's... Uh, uh, its potential is much, uh, is much smaller, but of course if it happens then everybody loses uh, to some degree from that. 
if we look a little bit more closely, a little bit more deeply into these processes, then a couple of other things come out that I think, uh, uh, that I think really merit uh, close attention. One of these is that, uh, that the idea of growth through trade is one that is not just about earning dollars, earning foreign exchange, and then spending those on bridges. Uh, it also has a very important dynamic component as well. Economists refer to this usually as the caldor verdons effect. Uh, it's a kind of an empirical regularity which says that the longer the production run, the more productive the producer becomes. That's the essence of it. Uh, the original statement of this actually puts some parameters on that. I'm not sure how how much we should trust those, but the idea and the empirical regularity that follows that idea is that the more you sell, uh, the more potentially, uh, the more potential productive productivity growth you get. And in the long run, of course, productivity growth is what is going to sustain and drive economic growth and poverty alleviation in the developing world. So if there is an opportunity for productivity growth through trade that is being attenuated by the unilateral uh, actions of countries like the United States, then that's going to have maybe not so big, but certainly tangible uh, long-term costs for the developing world. And that's something that I think we need to explore much more closely. The second is an institutional point, and that is that uh, by showing its willingness to go outside of the established set of rules, the WTO, uh, for resolving international trade disputes, the United States has really done a disservice to the developing world. So whatever uh, uh, whatever you think about the WTO, it is an incredibly effective means for leveling the playing field uh, between big and small countries. Big countries can win trade wars if they really want to, if they're willing to impose sufficient costs on themselves and others. Uh, the WTO provides a set of institutions and a set of mechanisms through which uh, uh, smaller countries, uh, that is mostly countries in the developing world, have a better opportunity for uh, a level playing field and for equal treatment. So um, if the move towards bilateralism means that the WTO gets sidelined, gets diminished, gets forgotten about, then that will absolutely hurt developing countries when push comes to shove on trade disputes. They will not have a leg. They won't have a voice to stand on. So I think those are uh, both short-term and long-term implications of uh, what we've been calling trade wars and, and the backlash against uh, globalization uh, for the developing world. And looking out a little bit further, I think that the structural changes that I began talking about are also uh, things that we should take into account here. Uh, and in particular, uh, the deepening of domestic supply chains in countries like China, which means that their dependence on trade networks with uh, the rest of Asia, for example, uh, becomes diminished. And then skill-biased technical change, which both of our previous speakers here uh, referred to as well. Uh, so the really big threats, I think, uh, particularly to the late, late entrance to globalization, that is countries in East Africa and West Africa, uh, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, and a few other uh, countries like that. The really, the, the ones that were, that have been the last in the door, if you like, of globalization and participation in global value chains, I think that the threats from both of these uh, structural shifts are really uh, quite significant. Uh, if China continues as it has, I think, to increase productivity right across the board and not to shed its most labor-intensive, low-tech industries at the rate that we all thought it would. So that means that there's less uh, opportunity being created for producers in a country like Pakistan, which is uh, a very labor-intensive, low-tech country and should actually be a natural host for those kinds of industries. But it doesn't look like they're going there. Uh, secondly, skill bias technical change. So almost every production process is getting automated in some degree, and to the extent that it is, the potential for new investment and new op uh, growth to create jobs for low, low intent, sorry, low skill, labor intensive countries is also diminishing. And we don't really know uh, how that's going to play out uh, yet over the next generation or so. So I guess um, uh, I am concerned about the backlash against. Uh, globalization. It is not a widely shared uh, phenomenon within the world as a whole. It's very specific uh, to the North Atlantic uh, countries, um, but it has implications for everyone. And some of those implications have, you know, potential long-term and structural effects that we haven't really begun, I think, yet to confront and to fully understand. That'll be played out over the next 10 or maybe 15 years. And I guess um, uh, I want to conclude. Uh, by saying that that no country is uh, completely uh, dependent on world markets and uh, 
the idea of participation in world markets is also uh, an option for every country. They can exclude themselves if they really want to. And so I think a logical conclusion from that is that for almost every country in the developing world seeking to grow and seeking to sustain growth, trade is going to be important and international integration is going to be uh, important and it's going to continue to be important and because most of that growth is taking place now in the global south, the opportunities for that will continue to grow uh, in spite of what the United States and, and uh, the other North Atlantic countries do. And in the end, uh, the bottom line for individual countries is going to be, I think, less about what the United States does and less about what the North Atlantic countries do and much more about the kind of policies that they adopt for themselves and the extent to which those policies uh, uh, enhance or impair the competitiveness of local industries, the opportunities for local investment, and thus uh, the opportunities for local job creation. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for three tremendous insights into the, the state of the world economy, and in particular with trade. Um, and it's been great because we've seen different sections and different perspectives that I think would be typically covered in an American newspaper, at least. Um, let me take uh, moderator's per, uh, prerogative to ask a couple questions to just throw out, and you can respond or not, um, as you wish. Uh, for all three of you, I guess um, two things have risen. One is the uh, issue of, um, I guess, what was termed techno-nationalism. Uh, but I, I think it's this general concern about intellectual property rights co combined with concern about um, the leakage of technology, particularly um, you know, from, let's say, the U.S. to other countries, um, and then the competition with China. And so I wonder, you know, what is the, uh, what is the possibility for backsliding and sort of, um, I wouldn't say backsliding, but um, retrenchment in the sort of regime of international or foreign direct investment? given that the U.S. has revamped its um, national security apparatus for dealing with foreign direct investment. I believe the Canadians have moved towards something like that as well, uh, maybe the, the Germans as well, toward the review on national security concerns of foreign direct investment. To what extent is that justified? To what extent is that a guise for just protectionism against um, foreign direct investment? Um, how do you see that? And then I guess the second thing is, once again, focusing on my favorite topic, U.S.-China, um, you know, do we view the, the current sort of uh, fracas as a, uh, as a U.S. versus the rest of the world in some respects in terms of um, protectionism? Um, is it, or is it primarily something that's a U.S.-China conflict that is going to color or tinge all the relationships that we see between other countries and how they conduct them? Um, uh, their international economic relations, their trade relations. So those are two wide-ranging questions. They seem to focus on China a bit, but, but I hope um, they can spur some conversation. So um, whoever wants to take first shot. Yeah, I can. Uh, I'll just take the second question first, which mm -hmm. is, you know, is, is there a demonstration effect here? And I think that the, uh, in Europe we had a, uh, a statement about the importance of taking cases to the WTO this week uh, with a very pointed reference or uh, to the United States uh, and its decision to go you know, uh, bilaterally as opposed through the WTO. This involved uh, European Union objecting to certain uh, practices in India and in Turkey and saying these cases uh, belong rightly inside the uh, WTO. So rather than just having, you know, other countries following along, I think we are seeing some hopeful signs of other uh, regions, not just European Union, but also Japan. We saw Japan step up to uh, exert leadership to get the TPP through after the U.S. Uh, pulled out. It's now the CPTPP, Comprehensive and Progressive TPP. But nevertheless, we saw Japan move out of the shadows a bit and, and take role. So I don't think we're necessarily just going to see everybody following along. And th these are good signs, I think, for the health of the global economy. On the first question about whether um, things like Burma or the revised uh, approach the U.S. is taking to um, review a foreign investment, I think there are many people who welcome this uh, and the belief that there are legitimate national security concerns, that the entire apparatus needed to be updated, uh, 
um, and that it needed extra resources. It was very fairly uh, underfunded. Most people never heard of it, in, uh, and uh, subjecting uh, you, you know a, a purchase uh, to review was you know was optional. Um, it didn't cover new emerging technologies like AI and other things which we think are coming down the pike. So that's important. However, we're not really having a national conversation about what are our strategic assets and where these lines are drawn. And if you think about who's going to lobby in favor of uh, making sure that foreign investment doesn't happen, uh, you may see that there's a lot of room there for going too far uh, in terms of restricting investment. Or you could probably make the case that there's also some cases for not going far enough. So I think it's really a case where we need to start thinking about where we draw those lines, given that they're moving away from a bit more narrowly focused uh, national security uh, realm where we thought we knew what the technologies were that we were dealing with to now where we're dealing with whether you swipe right or swipe left. So under the grinder. It's a grinder joke. Okay. Thank you. So I, I agree with Mary on very much on sort of it's a good thing that we're sort of paying attention to this, it, but also it's not just that we haven't thought enough about drawing these lines. We haven't. We've been sort of blatantly careless on some of these things, such as national security, and we've seen this in the 232 cases where it, it is a dangerous direction because you can be very expansive. She brings up Grinder. You can talk about Smithfield Ham. You can talk about um, you know sort of all kinds of, and then things which may not be as obvious, like the purchase of the Chicago Stock Exchange, where. On the face of it, you could say, oh no, a stock exchange. But you know, you look into the details and there's actually not that much technology transfer of any sort that would have been going on there. You can block a lot of transactions. Um, this actually, I think, gets into your second point a little bit, which is to what extent will this be isolated? Will this be US-China, US versus the rest of the world? Um, I think this is worrisome. So first, from a strategic standpoint, the US has done a particularly poor job of rallying other countries in this fight, which you know, both by stepping away from the TPP and then also by attacking them simultaneously, um, which does tend to undermine alliance somewhat. Um, but, but so, you know, what could have been a much more effective approach to change objectionable Chinese behaviors, and there are clearly objectionable Chinese behaviors, uh, hasn't been. So then it kind of ends up, yes, a little bit as U.S. versus rest of the world, where it could have been rest of world, all of the world versus China on some of these things. I think the when you you sort of intriguingly sort of discussed is this going to tinge all these other relationships? To the it's not entirely clear what world this administration envisions, which has sort of the U.S. and China in it, and how they're supposed to coexist. I've joked sometimes that it's almost as if a reality it's a reality show where they want to vote China off the planet, you know. It's sort of, but that's not an option, you know. You don't get to do that, and that they're they're still going to be there. So what are you doing with each other? And are we trying to quarantine China? And if we're trying to quarantine them, then yes, this very much tinges all these other relationships. And you're starting to see, we haven't gone quite that far, but you're starting to see those kinds of discussions when it comes to things like the Belt and Road Initiative. And then you get defectors like Italy, who will then sort of go in. And then that's all, it's sort of trying to create a Cold War atmosphere where you're drawing these battle lines. So I think there is a real concern about this tinging all these relationships. Yeah, I guess that. Uh, just really quickly on the on the second thing, you know, will the will this uh, uh, walking away from the WTO? Will this, is this a process that'll metastasize uh, around the world? I think you know, future uh, historians of international economic institutions, I guess that's a field, right? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I think we'll come back and look at the Doha round and and find a lot of researchable material there. So the Doha round, the so-called Doha development round of global trade talks, ran for about a decade and then kind of fizzled out, and uh, while there are different opinions about why it fizzled out, one of the obvious things that happened was that the, uh, a large block of developing countries uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't agree to the kind of terms that were being demanded by a kind of a significant block of wealthy countries, and they all uh, decided just to walk away and do stuff bilaterally and regionally and, uh, and sub-regionally as well. And I think, uh, I'm going to sound prescriptive here, but I think that the developing world is going to find that it made a big mistake that uh, they, really, they really need and can benefit from uh, a robust WTO in a way that the wealthy countries don't necessarily do. And that, uh, and that going back to the table in Doha was probably a really good thing for like India to do. They didn't do it. 
and maybe over the next decade or so they'll they'll come around and see that again. I don't think there's any developing world interest in walking away from these institutions. Wonderful. Well, uh, we certainly have time now for uh, questions from the floor, so let's uh, start. Um, I'll, okay, let's um, collect up a couple questions uh, in the brown jacket and then in the uh, red shirt. First, go ahead. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, you're right. It's a, it's a very good point of reference, which is that we've seen these kinds of changes before. I think you have to go a little farther back, but you do see that with agriculture, where it used to be the predominant activity in the United States, um, certainly around the time of the revolution, like, and then a steady decline to, what are we, around 3% or something of the populace sort of doing agriculture. You asked sort of what comes next. I think to some extent this is a classification issue. So we see we're heavily a services economy, and it's just kind of what, what services does one talk about? You mentioned the IT sector. You know, when I was growing up here, you know, programming was, you know, writing basic code and, you know, lines this. Well, people don't do that as much anymore. You, but you write more sophisticated code. You sort of move on to other things. So I don't see that, we're, you know, okay, we're all going to end up in mining. No. Um, the, you know, it's not that we're going to move away from services that way, but the type of services will change, and you'll sort of get a steady reclassification that way. That's as close as you'll ever get me to being a futurist. So, I mean, I think there's two issues here about fairness. One is about U.S. role in the world. And, um, you know, we've, been, we've had a steady diet of a narrative where U.S. gives and gives and gets nothing back. And I think we have to, you know, return to a narrative, a more balanced narrative, where we think about what the benefits to the United States were in being a leader in the creation of the World Trade Organization or prior to that general agreement on tariffs and trade or uh, from NATO or others. And if and there may be some of these where we need to have, uh, you know, some rebalancing. Um, so that, that's one thing. I think the narrative, the political narrative matters. You know, the, the presidency is called the bully pulpit for a reason, right? And it does set a tone. I think you're seeing people, uh, perhaps as Phil said, we're having an honest conversation and, and you know, some of the survey information that he showed shows people are actually just not just following along, despite the narrative we hear in the press all the time. They are thinking about it for themselves. And I think one thing they're thinking about is that we are a generous people. We're a rich country. We want fairness at home. So I think this does come back to what do we want from our government in terms of creating a safety net that makes globalization possible. Um, and. Um, you know, this goes back to work Danny did years ago and other people looking at what, what needs to be in place for a country where citizens are subjected to a, a lot of uh, external shocks. And, you know, there's a lot of things that we could do. You know the list, uh, including portable health care and a whole bunch of other things that make it tolerable for people to uh, be exposed to shocks where all of a sudden, you know, their job disappears. Um, and they have to worry about whether they're going to be able to get their meds the next day. So I think there's a lot of things. Uh, we are going to have that conversation, I think, moving into 2020. 
And so I think that conversation about what's fair at home actually feeds into what we as Americans can do in the world. So this is a question for Professor Cox. Uh, I'm sure all of you read Cooper's uh, article that basically said go about to America. You kind of understand uh, a survey that was about this uh, and sorry, a couple of years ago that pretty much said the same problems we have in the world Wisconsin of America in terms of economic opportunity and so on and so forth that exist in Germany and the developed world. So uh, the question that I would ask is the context of institutional terms, which the University of Wisconsin Madison has a great goal in terms of the divorce, deportation, reportation, weak theory, et cetera. Uh, for Professor Cockett, is there any hope for rural Wisconsin, uh, given where it is in agriculture, and dairy, and population, and demographics, and healthcare, education, infrastructure? Or should we find a, a way to simply kind of move the folks from the city, like happened after the cutover in northern Wisconsin? <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> Thanks. I, I, I know who I would like to direct that question to, one of my colleagues, but, uh, uh, but it's a really, really good question. It's not, of course, just Wisconsin that we're thinking about when you talk about that. So, so uh, I don't have a complete answer for you. Uh, I, think that, uh, I think that the, uh, the kinds of things that Mary just referred to uh, are really important in this context, which is that as the structure of the economy changes and things like dairy, and other uh, agricultural activities become very much smaller in the, in the total economy, then there has to be a set of mechanisms, institutions, as well as policies in place that facilitate people's moving away from dependence on those industries, uh, either to value-added industries that are downstream from there or towards other uh, occupations altogether. That is inevitable. Right? Then the question is how fast and how costly uh, that process would be. I, I guess. You know, this is your question isn't really directly about trade, because uh, the the trade part of that story is not a very big part of it. The the the, the really big part is demographic, uh, I think, and uh, and then connected to that, the set of institutions and policies in place in the United States that actually facilitate people's uh, mobility. So you know, a big part of the China shock literature is about people who can't move because they have mortgages underwater or. They have two spouses as well as the, well, they have both spouses with jobs and they've got kids in school. And so they experience a negative shock. And, you know, economic theory that we teach in 101 says, well, you just get up and go somewhere else. Labor's mobile. Well, it's not mobile. Uh, that's what we're learning, I think, in a very clear way from that, from that literature. And if it's not mobile, then there is a mandate on government that uh, cares about its constituents to make sure that those whose mobility is constrained in some way still have an opportunity to have a good life. There is the, just the, it's not about trade, but as an example for a, a marker, the paper industry uh, technology center in Cox Valley is now about 30 miles from the Shanghai. Some of the same people that work there, well, the Girl Center did a pretty good documentation. So that's not a trade issue, but it's a global trade issue. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so my question is about the source of this backlash. And I'm really struck by actually this figure. But I, I picked up similar data for um, my class about foreign policy and try to turn it into my opinion about trade. And I was really surprised by the mismatch between the political network and actually what the public was telling researchers. So I found you know, the same data here from the um, Chicago Council, but also Gallup data shows sort of similar patterns of actual, you know, increasing optimism about trade. And so my question is, to what extent do you think this is a Trump story, um, or is this actually something that would happen even in the absence of Trump? You know, Mary talked about that a little bit, but I'd love to hear more. And then a related question is, what happens after Trump? You know, whether that's in two years or six years, when you say this uh, is a Trump story, you mean the trade wars, or you mean the public opinion shift? So, 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 so,
Um, yeah, maybe I can take a stab at this. So I think it has been, so if you look at the sort of manufacturing stuff that I put up, you, you have a source of discontent. Put yourself in the position of a labor leader. What do you have to offer? If you think there are several sources of this sort of decline in, in available jobs, you can talk about technology, you can talk about domestic competition that we saw, you know, if you, what sort of killed the textile industry in the Northeast, the Southeast, you know, you're getting competition in autos to the Great Lakes region from the Southeast as well and from the South. Um, you can't do anything about either one of those. You can't really stop technology. You can't block domestic competition. The thing that's left is trade. So if you were going to rally and say, I'm going to do something for you, that's the one you will focus on. And I think what we've had for a long time was a fairly one-sided conversation that way because that being the only actionable item, you focus disproportionately on that as a source of these ills. And meanwhile, the other side the one that says we actually get a lot from trade, largely sat on the sidelines and figured, don't worry, the technocrats will take care of this. And so you had politicians who sort of played both sides of this sometimes. Um, Barack Obama was one of them, vowing to uh, leave NAFTA, you know, pledging to find China a currency manipulator, and then saying in the end, well, I'll just take care of it. So in adopting many of John McCain's policies, I worked in the McCain campaign. Um, the, uh, so I think you have it. What we've seen more recently is, so are, are these policies actually Trump policies? Yeah, I think they are pretty distinctively Trump policies because I think you had other politicians like President Obama who would get into office and say, oh, wow, that would be really damaging to do a big trade war with China. I'm not at all convinced that we're winning this one. Um, that that would be a really damaging thing to do. I care a lot about national welfare. I'm not going to do that. President Trump has a very different perception of national welfare. That is something distinctive to him. And so therefore, I think he's much more likely to, to do those policies. Um, as sort of a closing thought on this, maybe an analogy that will sort of stick with you all. So I, I come from a family of doctors, so I you know, pick up a little bit about sort of medicine. The way you find out like what sometimes different parts of the brain do is people have very unfortunate accidents. You know, you get like a, an arrow shot through some lobe and then you can't talk. Oh, I guess that's what that lobe did. You know, we're doing this a little bit with the economy on trade right now. That you, you go after various parts, you shut them down, you see what kind of, sort of really negative effects you get and say, oh, now I understand. And so I think, you know, at least there's learning coming out of the process. Thank you. I want to extend the discussion of the world because I think it also that helps shed some light on what I saw in that and what we do. I think it's kind of like that. The rules are fine, but this is the direction of that. And we get to the question of what I think you, you, you're right that uh, that globalization is used much more clearly uh, in the global world because it global sort of seems as something that is generally bad and that super global world has fallen down well. But there we get into the deeper we find an interesting paradox, which is that uh, it's a practice that have got the best since like the 1990s with the existing rules and not ones that actually make why the rules of the post 1990 uh, or the information on the trade agreements. China is the greatest case. The reason is that we talk so much about China, aside from the national security issues, also is that China has basically violated um, uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, if not the letters, and the spirit of the WTO, um, certainly uh, has escaped uh, sort of regional trade agreements in any kind of information. China's government engagement. Policy, policy, industrial policies, credit subsidies, currency management, etc. Everything that was supposed to be outside the rule of the game since uh, the 1990s. And, and uh, uh, to, to great effect, and arguably China is not even more than the rest of the world for having wrong 
sort out of the way from the lack of such policies. Um, and we could have in other markets, you know, the world goes, and so there's a paradox that maybe actually we have more trade and bigger market in China today, where it's trade problems because it's sort of this violated the tools. Um, on the other hand, we look at some of which developing countries have done not that well. Uh, here's an example of Mexico, which has sort of essentially, you know, has been the deep integration that it has lost, not just because it's just south of the border from the United States, and it's a country that had greatest needs in terms of integrating itself into the supply chains uh, in North America. Of course, the sun runs after um, the So it was basically did everything that it could uh, to play by the rules of this sort of mutual spending um, and And the Mexican economy is always bad and bad enough to afford full country productivity growth uh, since the 1990s, essentially, has been made uh, the economy as a whole. Um, so, the, so, the, so, the, so, the, so the one thing that that makes me do is that, that I think what the local governments are doing is a kind of uh, romanticizing uh, the kind of localization that they actually want because they largely, the successful ones, um, have been largely able to evade uh, the post-1990 rules. Uh, and and uh, that, 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 that conscious that actually hasn't sunk in yet uh, quite. Now, the second component of this is that when I mean, you look at into the future, what's going to happen, you mentioned this, is that, that, that uh, there is a process where, uh, of um, technological change and other things that are really driving um, a deindustrialization very rapidly in the world of countries. So, the idea that, that countries will be able to replicate, the countries will be able to replicate the staging model of export oriented industrialization becoming more and more remote. Um, uh, even Vietnam never ever industrialized in the levels that South Korea and Taiwan did, and Ethiopia did never industrialize in the levels that they did not. And that means that these kinds of gains from uh, the strategy are becoming significantly lower. Uh, and, and I worry that, 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 that this backlash might appear uh, developing uh, a country in some bad. And try to just want to draw on one of these um, sort of public opinion surveys that, that go through. Um, public opinions are called commercial by Americans are going to spread. They've always been in favor of trade. Where you get the big um, uh, gap is if you ask them about what do you think about trade agreements? What do you think about the WTO? That's where you get the big uh, gap. And the big suspicion, and uh, again, it's really about the rules. People don't like the rules. They don't like the agreements that the United States has signed. I think that's really part of the agreement. So we need to really differentiate very clearly that, that really nobody is fundamentally against trade. Um, but people don't like uh, to, you know, put the rules as they are. And I think it's very easy to convince them. And the back of the back of sometimes correct, uh, oftentimes, as we pointed out, all stories about what it does. But fundamentally, we don't recognize that there are issues with rules. They try to illustrate that to the global countries, they can like the comments they want to put about the global. But I mean, we, we need to point out much more the issue of so what's ailing to the, to the rules um, and, and not uh, volumes of failures. Yeah, no, thanks, Danny. Uh, uh, lots of food for thought there. I guess um, I want to I want to say three things. The first is uh, you you talk about the paradox that the biggest winners since 1990s, so in the era of modern globalization, if you like, uh, have been those countries that didn't play by the rules. And I, I, you know, Phil mentioned identification problems earlier, and I think this is a, an example of an identification problem that we have to confront. So if we think about China, which was the example you gave, uh, clearly a country that doesn't play by the rules, uh, but uh, how, much of, how much of the winning that China has done is attributable to the fact that it doesn't play by the rules versus other things? And I'm going to push back a little bit and say that other things uh, should not be underestimated there. So, you know, prior to China's accession to the WTO, they had invested a tremendous amount of effort in policy reforms that I think were really first order changes, and you know what they are. It's moving from autarky to any sort of trade, uh, 
It's opening up domestic markets, especially uh, initially agricultural markets, which had an enormous impact, as we all know, on poverty. Uh, and then subsequently, and uh, I will say much more reluctantly, uh, opening up factor markets as well. So labor partially, uh, capital somewhat, land kind of. But you know, I think that no matter how limited these reforms have been in scope and no matter uh, how reluctantly some of them have been undertaken, I would, I would argue that they have had a much bigger impact on the winning that China has done than the fact that it's uh, not played by strictly by, by the WTO rules uh, in the post-1990 era. And I guess, um, and I guess uh, there's, there's actually a kind of a, a really interesting thought that comes to mind, which is that uh, back in the early years of, uh, of modern economic development, back in the 1950s and the early 60s, countries used to look at China and say, there's a model for development, it's autarkic, they manage everything, they control all the prices, that's great, let's do that. Failed, right? And, uh, and now I think uh, it would be really, I think, very risky to look at China's uh, current model and say that that's a, a good one to follow. And I think about countries like Vietnam and Bangladesh proportionally uh, winning just as much as China in terms of poverty alleviation and productivity growth uh, whilst being so small that they have no option but to play by the rules. Uh, so I guess uh, I'm not convinced that, uh, that the fact that a country doesn't exactly comply with the, the global trading system should be uh, given first order uh, uh, priority in explaining its success. That would be my response to that. Uh, second thing, very, very quickly, uh, the, the, the small developing countries get very generous treatment under the global trading system. Of course, they, they are much less constrained in terms of economic policy, especially in key industries like manufacturing and agriculture, and they take full advantage of that, as they should, uh, and I think that that's really important. Um, now these are the, we're talking here about the original WTO members, the 1994 members, countries that came later, like China and like Vietnam, of course, faced far more stringent requirements uh, in terms of policy reforms. And I think that is something that we should uh, take into account. And then finally, I think you get to the real point in the last comment, which is if we're going to have a lot of skill biased technical change and the kinds of now, labor intensive uh, job growth opportunities that characterize the last generation of economic growth in poor countries are not available for the next generation. That is the number one economic development problem that we must confront. And I don't have an answer to that at the moment, except to say that you may not like the rat race, that is the global trading system, but it's the only race in town. And so that's got to be one of the parameters that has to be taken into account as countries figure out how they will deal with the fact that they're not going to become global exporters of garments or simple electronics or something like that in the way that previous countries did. I have no answer for that. Uh, three quick thoughts. One, I thought the distinction you drew between the spirit and the letter of the global rules was very important. And I wouldn't go so quickly to saying, oh, it's clear someone violated, because I'm not sure it's actually that useful to think about the spirit of WTO rules. It's not a sort of principles down kind of organization. It's very particular agreements. And those agreements are often quite limited. So I think if you look, people often think, well, subsidies, you know, that, that violates the spirit of sort of fair trade and engagement. Well, as you know very well, they've tried to put limits on subsidies. And people's general stance on subsidies is subsidies are terrible except for the ones that I use. And then you get sort of a least common denominator set of subsidies rules. And so you get a very large gap between what people think of as the spirit of the rules and the actual rules. It's not clear to me, well, no, no countries are perfect, and China certainly isn't. I think you get very different reckonings if you look at those two things. I think they've tried to be a lot better about the letter of, of the law. And of course, it's been a major shift because they're substantially less devoted to reform than they were at the time when they joined the WTO, which meant that you weren't getting tight strictures at the time because it was kind of a, well, we're all working on this together as opposed to a more adversarial relationship now. On the Mexico point, it, it's intriguing, it, as you know very well. You know, we've sort of treated this as if China's a major competitor for the United States, whereas in fact, we've got, you know, sort of very different endowments where, you know, sort of, uh, you might have thought that, you know, somebody, a country that's sort of on the other side of the comparative advantage scale would, would enhance you know, well-being, and we've had some studies that have shown that. If you're Mexico, however, and you're trying to do sort of the nearby labor-intensive stuff, and then a more labor-intensive country comes along, 
they're the ones who had a real complaint. Um, so this gets back to the identification question, is that there's other stuff happening. It's not clear that they would have been better off by you know, skewing the whole system. Uh, but yes, you're right that it's been a tough time. Your final point about, you, you are quite correct, there's a distinction between how people feel about trade and how they feel about trade policy. Curiously enough, you've gotten a lot of pro-trade policy um, findings. So I remember being struck a few years back, this was 2015, before the TPP was even concluded, my colleagues bring me the results, and you were getting 60 to 70 percent approval of the TPP when I didn't even approve of the TPP because I didn't know what was in it. It hadn't been finished yet. But, but you were getting this sort of general baseline approval of that, um, more so among Democrats than among Republicans. Democrats were significantly higher than Republicans when they did that breakdown. This is all by way of they're about to hand this off to the political scientists. But what it suggests is that maybe we're thinking less of a median voter world and more of special interest politics. Wow. <laughs> Well, I think that um, it's very hard to evaluate the net effect of China's rule breaking. But to say that you know the bad boy always wins and the good boy never wins, I think is 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 let's just say the jury's still out on that. China is a is a very special case uh, for for a wide variety of reasons. Um, but one of the things we can look at is what do we know about some of the interventions that they've made. And you know there was a long period of time from the mid 1990s to about 2003 where their industrial policies basically were reform and opening, and they were wildly successful. But also had a lot of, I know you're shaking your head, but I, what also had an enormous uh, adjustment costs. So we think about the huge layoffs that happened in urban China with the SOE reforms, which were enormous and really teed them up for what happened a lot in terms of the 2000s. But you know I don't think it would sustain. Uh, be sustainable in a democracy given the amount of pain that people went through at that point. But So enormous reforms that happen. Um, then we see huge industrial subsidies. A good example is solar, where they essentially won with solar in the sense that they pumped a lot of money into solar. Uh, they went from being basically not really an exporter to being the world's dominant exporter in a breathtakingly short period of time. And yet, huge bankruptcies, huge amount of subsidies, and you know, basically, very poor Chinese citizens getting caught holding the bag for all that money. So, again, you can say that they look like they won, but really, did they win? Um, I think on a lot of most cost-benefit or even social welfare calculations, they wouldn't have won from those policies. So, can they grow? Is some government intervention or, uh, in a sense, industrial policy good? I think we're moving to a situation where even the United States are willing to say, yeah, maybe we should be doing things. Let's go see those airports and roads and the incredible buildup of the tertiary sector in China. But, um, you know, there are many, many cases where this has not borne out. And so I don't think a complete reckoning is anywhere near to being done. One problem, of course, being that information is really hard to get. Well, um, I, I think we've come to a complete agreement on every uh, area here, so wonderful. So thank you for to the uh, panelists and to the, the audience for your questions. Um, and